All right, for this week, we're gonna discuss chapter two, which is an integrative um, approach to psychopathology. So we're gonna kind of talk about how all of abnormal behavior is viewed from different perspectives. So first off, we can have a one-dimensional model of behavior, which says that um, behavior can be um, described in terms of a single cause, just one reason. Um, it could be something conceptual, something related to a paradigm or a school of thought. Um, and when we look at things from a one dimensional perspective, we're going to ignore any information that doesn't fit into that dimension. For example, if we wanted to explain obsessive compulsive disorder as a result of family history alone, and we ignore any other um, genetic or environmental factors that could play a role in development of that disorder. A multi-dimensional model is probably what most uh, clinicians will use to diagnose a disorder because it's interdisciplinary, it's eclectic, and it's integrative. So it's when you look at many different aspects of that could cause a disorder to happen. So it looks at a system as influencing um, and maintaining suffering. This is when we also draw upon information from several different sources, and we can say that those uh, behaviors are the result of many different influences. So in terms of psychology, there are six major schools of thought that we can use to explain behavior. There's biological, behavioral, emotional, social and cultural, developmental and environmental. And these are all of the things we're gonna look at a little bit closer. So if we think about um, the blood injection injury phobia um, and we looked at it from a multidimensional um, influence, then we could look at biological influences and behavioral influences and emotional and cognitive influences as well as social influences. So we could look at all of the different things that could impact a phobia. Okay, so socially, Judy's fainting causes disruptions in her school and at her home. And um, the principal could suspend her and the doctor could say that nothing is physically wrong. From a biological perspective, it could be something that's inherited that causes her to faint. From a behavioral perspective, um, she could faint when she sees blood or she could try to escape and avoid situations that call, where blood is involved because she doesn't like it. And then from an emotional and cognitive influence, um, it could be that her anxiety or her fear levels increase whenever she sees blood. So those are just, um, a, that's a multi-dimensional way of looking at something. So first it starts with a trigger, you know, blood. And then we, if we look at all of the different things that could cause it, then we can make up a disorder or not really make up a disorder, but we can label that as being disordered. From a genetic standpoint, there are many contributions that our genetics play in our ability to develop a psychological disorder. When we um, start to think about genes or our nature, we have to think about phenotypes and genotypes. Your phenotype is really how something manifests in a person, you know, whether they have brown hair and brown eyes or, uh, or light hair and light eyes. That's a part of their ph phenotype. And then a genotype is their genetic status. It has to do with having a certain gene or a certain allele that will make you susceptible to something. And when it comes to the nature of our genes, of course, we have DNA, which is a double helix, and everybody has 23 pairs of chromosomes. Some of them are more dominant, some of them are more recessive, and the de our development and our behavior can be polygenetic. That means that we can have several genes that contribute to the outcome of us developing um, physically, emotionally, mentally, but then also our experiences of behavior can be caused by a number of different genes. So when it comes to our um, ability to experience psychopathology, 
um, genetics are said to contribute to about or less than 50% of our psychopathology. So that lets us know that most of it's coming from our environment. When it comes to genetic interactions with the environment, um, there's been a lot of research on, you know, how does our environment impact our genetics? And what's been found is that the genetic structure of cells can change as a result of our learning experiences. So for example, an inactive gene may become active because of something in their environment. So, you know, I could ingest something that's environmental and that could cause something that was laying dormant inside of my body to activate. The diathesis a stress model says that disorders are the result of this underlying risk factor. So, and also life stressors. So it could be underlying risk factors like intolerance to distress, sensitivity to physical sensations and other life stressors like losing a job or getting married. All of those things can um, contribute to our ability to develop a psychological disorder because we've got those risk factors. So something like blood injury, phobia, and alcoholism, you know, we have the disorder. If we look at these cups at the top, so I experienced some type of life event or stressor, and I've already got a genetic vulnerability, which is going to be my diathesis, then clearly I'm going to be really close to sort of having, you know, going over that line. One thing I always tell students is it's a very thin line between experiencing a disorder and not experiencing a disorder. And, you know, if the right combination of things happen, we all could experience something. So if you look at that second cup, if you see, okay, there's a stressor, you know, drinking in college, plus the genetic disposition, and <clears throat> there you go. Then it could lead to a person becoming an alcoholic. Whereas, you know, if all you have is alcoholism, that person may not become an alcoholic because there's not too many factors there impacting them. So the reciprocal gene environment model tells us that different outcomes are the result of interactions between our genetic vulnerabilities and our experiences. So, you know, experiencing depression and being impulsive you know, once those things interact with each other, of course, that could lead to more of a susceptibility to developing a disorder. Epigenetics and the non-genomic um, inheritance of behavior also tells us that genes, genes, we can't explain everything from our genes because there's also some environmental influences such as parenting style, such as lack of resources, that may override what is happening to us genetically. So we always have to keep in mind that um, nature nurtures a bait when we're thinking about what is playing the most role in how we develop psychopathology. From a neurological standpoint, in the field of neuroscience, we have to look at the nervous system and how disease and behavior develops within our nervous system. So first we have to think about the differences between the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system is going to consist of all of our somatic and autonomic branches. So that's going to be everything related to our skeletal muscles, and our ability to engage in fight or flight and our muscle movements and things like that. Our central nervous system is where our brain and spinal cord are housed. And, you know, the brain and spinal cord are going to communicate with that peripheral nervous system so that we are able to function on a daily basis. So in thinking about neuroscience, hopefully you remember from your general psychology class, sort of the structure of um, a neuron. And of course, we've got billions of these neurons throughout our brain that help us function on a day-to-day -day basis. 
and you've got your soma, which is a cell body, and that is where it's labeled um, nucleus there for you, and that is what maintains the health of the neuron. It's going to make sure that whatever is coming in or is is good to be passed along. And then we've got the dendrites. And those dendrites are those tree-like branches, and they receive uh, messages from other neurons. And we've got the axon, which is that long part. It's going to help send that message on to the next neuron. It's going to do so very fast because it's covered in those bubbles, which are considered myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath helps maintain that health of that axon. So you can do everything you need to do and function on a day-to-day -day basis. Then we've also got those axon terminals, and those are the buds at the end of the axon, which is where those chemicals are sent, and they look like buttons at the very end. And the synapses are going to be those small gaps that help separate neurons, and it's through there that neurotransmitters are able to be taken up or blocked from continuing to travel throughout the brain. When it comes to our neurons, they're going to act, um, operate electrically, and then they also communicate chemically because they are the chemical messengers that help our brain function. Continuing on with our look at how the brain is structured, we've got a brain stem that has a hindbrain, midbrain, thalamus, and hypothalamus, and all of these parts of the brain stand again uh, in, impact our ability to function to breathe to eat to know what to do on a day-to-day -day basis and then of course our forebrain also contains some different structures that also help with our overall functioning i won't go over all of the functions of these parts but hopefully you have all of your information from your general psych class and so you remember those things but I do want to take a closer look at the hindbrain and the midbrain because that's very important for us, especially from a um, psychopathology standpoint. The hindbrain is what's going to regulate our, our automatic processes, and that includes things like our medulla, which regulates our heart rate and our blood pressure and our respiration and damage to the medulla, which is in the back of your head, can be fatal. The pons also helps regulate our sleep stages and our ability to go into REM and stage one and stage two of sleep. Then we've also got the cerebellum, which helps with our physical coordination and our ability to move. We've got the midbrain, which coordinates our movements and our sensory inputs. And then also we've got the reticular activating system, or RAS, which is also where it's ha also housed in the midbrain. So another brain structure that's really important for you to know about, of course, is the limbic system. And the limbic system helps regulate our emotional experiences and how we express emotions. And that can include um, parts of the brain like the hippocampus, the synoculate gyrus, the septum, the amygdala. Um, all of these structures help with our emotional experiences. The hippocampus is really has, plays a really strong role in our emotional expression, um, especially when it comes to us being able to remember things. And the amygdala, of course, plays a role in our fight or flight responses. The forebrain is responsible for many of our sensory, emotional, and cognitive processing experiences. Um, we know that each hemisphere of the brain has four lobes and they're specialized for functioning. And the cerebral cortex is going to contain both the left and the right hemisphere. So let's take a little closer look at some of the lobes of the brain. And, you know, being able to look at a picture is one of the best ways to be able to understand this. So we've got the frontal lobe, which is that blue part. That's where all of our executive functioning, like thinking and reasoning, and our ability to remember stuff is housed. The parietal lobe is going to be that yellow area, and that is responsible for all of our touch um, recognition and you know, sort of the sensation of touch. Our occipital lobe is at the very back of our brain, and it's the red area, 
and that's responsible for our ability to see. And then the temporal lo lobes are those green parts. And I always tell students they're kind of on the side, which is close to your ears. So they're going to help you recognize sights and sounds. And also, they also play a role in your ability to remember um, things in the long term. When it comes to your peripheral nervous system, it controls your voluntary muscles and your movements. And uh, within it, you're going to have the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, branches. So these are going to be kind of involuntary processes, things that we do without knowing that we're doing. It also helps regulate our endocrine system and our ability to digest. It helps us also regulate our heart and um, body temperature. So that's all within the peripheral nervous system. So if you take a look sort of at this chart, um, it gives you a good idea of, you know, some of the parts of the peripheral nervous system, particularly if you look at the um, sympathetic nervous system, which is the red part. Um, those are what parts of the body those things function with. And then the blue lines represent the parasympathetic nervous system because both of those parts um, are important within the peripheral nervous system. And as we take a look at the endocrine system, this is what regulates our release of hormones. So you've got the HPA axis, which is um, the integration of our endocrine system and the nervous system. So it kind of overlaps them so that they can both function together. Now let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters are your body's natural chemicals and they help transmit mes messages between cells. So some chemicals can act as agonists and antagonists and agonists are gonna increase the activity of a neurotransmitter. It's going to mimic the effects that are happening while an antagonist is going to inhibit or block the production of a neurotransmitter so that it doesn't reach the receptor it's trying to get to. And um, you also can have some inverse agonists that produce effects that are opposite of those given neurotransmitters. But most drugs you're going to experience um, are either gonna act as agonists that help the neurotransmitter sort of work or they're gonna be antagonists that prevent those from working the way you want them to. So there are some main types of neurotransmitters we find in the brain that relate to psychology. And here are five of those main neurotransmitters. So we've got serotonin, glutamate, GABA, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And most students will usually know that serotonin is sort of responsible for our ability um, to function when it comes to our mood. Um, glutamate um, can have some excitatory effects. GABA, GABA can be inhibitory, where norepinephrine can, you know, is often known as noradrenaline, and epinephrine is known as adrenaline. They're kind of opposites of each other. So let's take a look at um, these neurotransmitters a little closer. So first we've got that mood neurotransmitter, which is serotonin or H or 5-HT. It influences our information processing, our behavior, our mood, and our thoughts. Um, we know that when serotonin is deregulated, it can contribute to depression. If a person has very, very low levels of serotonin, it can be linked to instability and then also impulsive behaviors. The next neurotransmitter we have is norepinephrine, which can also be called noradrenaline. It's involved in our alarm responses and our basic bodily processes like breathing. We've got dopamine, which has some implications in depression and ADHD. And it's, researchers have also found that increased levels of dopamine has also been linked to schizophrenia. And, um, when people have a reduced level of dopamine, um, that has also been found indicative in Parkinson's disease. When it comes to the brain and abnormal behavior, we also know that obsessive compulsive 
disorder um, can relate to differences or relations that are happening between the brain and abnormal behavior. So when a man developed OCD after part of his frontal cortex was damaged um, um, during brain surgery, we realized that perhaps there's some link between the brain and obsessive compulsive disorder. From a psychosocial um, influence, um, you have to think about whether or not the changing brain structure and function can be influenced by psychosocial factors that we might experience. So what are some implications for this? That means that um, treatments for mental health problems could now even start to focus on different brain regions that are found to be rele relevant for those problems. So as we discover more about the brain and what it influences, then we can sort of pinpoint some areas that might contribute or play a role in the development of psychopathology. Because, and we know that psychotherapy can change brain structure and function, as well as uh, medications in psychotherapy that can be used together to help impact um, functioning. When it comes to conditioning and cognitive processes, a lot of early research on classical conditioning has told us that we can have simple associations that can be learned between two things and those two things can happen together. After a while, research started to researchers started to backtrack a bit and say, well, maybe that's not the case. Um, things may not be that simple. Um, this sort of learning can be influences, influenced by things that are kind of higher order cognitive processes. So that's when researchers start to think of other learning types. So we could have responded and operant learning, learned helplessness, social learning, and prepared learning. So when it comes to your respondent and operant learning, this is when people repeat behaviors that are often uh, followed by good consequences and they perform those behaviors less than um, behaviors that are followed by bad consequences. Prepared learning involves making things easier. Um, when we associate when we make learning associations that were adapted for our ancestors to have in the past. So we've sort of prepared our bodies to be able to handle something. And um, those things can be easier for us, like acquiring a fear of spiders. Um, maybe that was useful for our ancestors to survive. So we might now have a fear of spiders because our ancestors had that same fear of spiders. With learned helplessness, it happens when you try to exert your influence over a challenging situation. And after time and time again, you're not able to do that. So you just eventually stop trying because you start to think that it's always going to happen. So I think of situations where people find themselves in domestic violence and they start to think, well, I can never find somebody who will be good to me because all they find are people who are not good to them. And sometimes it's, you've learned to be helpless. Like you've learned that, you know, you're letting people choose you who may not be right for you. So in this, you know, you just kind of stop, stop trying because you're faced with challenging situations and the results aren't any different. There could also be a dissociation between behavior and consciousness. So when we think of our implicit memories, that's when we act on the basis of an experience that we haven't recalled. Um, we could also have uh, blind sight. When some people who are blind, they can still sense objects that would be in their visual fields, even though they don't actually experience sight. And then we also know that there are some experimental tests that reveal um, these types of implicit processing. So emotions can also play a role in psychopathology. So our emotions can elicit or evoke action. It can make us um, take actions that are different from our affect and our mood. And intimately, it can be tied to several forms of psychopathology. So we have to look at our emotions and our behavior, our, the physiology of emotion and cognitive aspects all interact to make up psych psychopathology. 
So many um, types of psychopathology can be boiled down to problematic reactions to emotions. Like, for example, uh, some people with social anxiety don't like the way they feel in social situations. So they attempt to avoid those situations in order um, to not feel uncomfortable. So a lot of psychopathology can be boiled down to that. When we think of components of emotions, we have to think of behavior, physiology, and cognition. For example, when it comes to our fear, our anxious thoughts, our elevated heart rate, and our tendency to flee are all components of emotion. And then when we think about the harmful side of emotional dysregulation, that's when we express things like anger and hostility and sadness, and they can all interact and play a role in psychopathology. Some emotions like um, being hostile and emotional suppression can also have a negative um, impact on our overall health. Cultural factors can play a role in how psychopathology is, is influenced. Um, so certain cultures may express themselves differently than others. Gender could also play a role because men and women, let's face it, we express our emotions and handle things differently. Um, and then also social support um, can have an impact on your health and your behavior. Um, how frequently do you have others who are supportive of you? What is the quality of that support you're able to get from them? Um, because that can play a role in how um, you know disease manifests itself uh, when you experience it. So we know that culturally, socially, and interpersonally, all of these things can be situated to impact our psychopathology. Um, we also know that from a social standpoint, there is a stigma when it comes to mental illness. This may limit the degree to which people might express their mental health problems. If in your community, people view mental health in a negative way and, you know, think that you just need to pray about it or, you know, say things like you're crazy, that might impact whether or not you say something about having a problem. We might conceal our feelings of depression because our friends and our families don't support us for that. And it could also discourage um, somebody from ever getting treatment for something that really might be bothering them. So when we think about lifespan and the developmental influences of psychopathology, we have to keep in mind that developmental changes play a role and um, what is viewed as normal or abnormal can be based on different things in our environment that are impacting us. Some things that are normal at a certain age or stage are just not normal at a, another age or stage. It's okay as a two-year-old to throw a tantrum, even though we don't like it, but you shouldn't be 22 years old and throwing a tantrum. Um, we also have to remember the principle of equifinality, um, which says that um, delirium can be caused by a number of separate or, or related underlying conditions um, like post-operative states, drugs, and alcohol, urinary tract infections, fever, organ failure. Sometimes elderly individuals and children are also at higher risk for deliver delirium than other adults. Um, so we have to keep in mind that when it comes to equifinality, from a developmental perspective, there are certain um, groups that we have to look at differently. At one point, I worked in nursing homes and you know whenever any of our clients would seem delirious we immediately had to check for a urinary tract infection because you know sometimes people who are older might hallucinate or they may experience delusions when it's their bladder that's infected so to summarize everything from chapter two there can be uh, multiple causes um, when we think of multi development from a multi-dimensional perspective, we always want to take a broad, comprehensive, and systemic perspective when it comes to being able to explain psychopathology. We want to look at the biological and, and neuroscientific factors. We want to look at the cognitive and emotional factors and the social, cultural, and developmental factors. So a multi-dimensional, comprehensive comprehensive approach puts us in the best position. We don't want to just say there's one cause. We want to really understand all of the factors that can impact psychopathology so that we can alleviate 
and prevent those types of things from happening in the future. So I hope this was helpful with you understanding chapter two.